Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. My name is Dr. Amanda Wan, and I'm the director of the China Asia program here at IWP. For those who are new to IWP, um, we are a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have seven master's programs, including two online MAs, as well as a Doctor of Statecraft and National Security program, and 18 certificates of graduate study program, as well as a continuing education program. So if you are interested in learning more about any one of our educational programs, please feel free to come speak to me um, at the conclusion of the event, and I'll be more than happy to help you get connected with one of our recruiters. And also, if you'd like to support the work of IWP, please go to iwp.edu backslash donate. Today's event is part of the Asia Initiative Lecture Series, um, which I founded back in 2019. And today we have Ambassador Jose Manuel G. Romualdez, who will be giving a lecture on the topic of the U.S.-Philippines Alliance. Ambassador Romualdez was appointed Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines to the United States in July 2017 by President Rodrigo Roa Turte. On 29 November 2017, he presented his credentials to U.S. President Donald Trump and formally assumed office as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary. Additionally, as the head of the Philippine Embassy in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Romualdez is currently the Philippines Emissary to the Commonwealth of Jamaica, Republic of Haiti, Repo Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Dominica, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Vincent and the Grenadas, and St. Lucia. Prior to his appointment, Ambassador Romualdez was designated as a special envoy of the Philippine president to the U.S. He was he also served as a member of the several Philippine business delegations visiting the United States. China, Japan, and New Zealand from 1989 to 2012. Ambassador Romualdez has extensive experience as a media practitioner and business executive. He used to be the chief executive officer of Stargate Media Corporation and the publisher of People Asia Magazine, which is the Philippine Star Affiliate. He was president of the Manila Overseas Press Club and vice president of Rotary Club of Manila. Ambassador Romualdez writes columns for the Philippine Star, and all of his columns have a wide following of readers both in the Philippines and abroad. Well, thank you, Ambassador, for having us today, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amanda. Well, it's great to be back. Actually, this is, uh, I came here with my first year uh, as ambassador to the United States, and I, I think I enjoyed that, uh, that conversation we had here in this very same room. And, uh, things have uh, obviously changed since I've been here last. And, uh, okay, sorry. Gadgets. But anyway, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be back here, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you again to the Institute of World Politics for inviting me to speak here on the state of our bilateral relations between the Philippines and the United States at a time when the Indo-Pacific region and the wider international community are facing some of the most serious security challenges of our time. Since Ferdinand Marcos Jr. took his oath. As the president, 17th president of the Republic of the Philippines on the 30th of June last year. He has been consistent in communicating our independent foreign policy, not, not just to the nearly 114 million Filipinos, but to the rest of the world as well. He is focused on rebalancing relations with the old and new partners and has emphasized that the Philippines shall continue to be a friend to all and an enemy to none. In his engagement with various regional and multilateral forums, including his participation at the ASEAN and APEC summits last year, President Marcos consistently called for countries to exert every effort in addressing the most pressing challenges facing not only the Philippines, but many countries as well. 
These include food and energy security, pandemic preparedness, and the reinforcement of global health systems, addressing climate change, access to digital and communications technologies, revitalize trade and investment, and inclusion in sustainable and reliable global value chains. While economic recovery and growth have taken the overwhelming focus of the Philippine government under President Marcos, we are fully aware that there are many factors that affect our desire not only to get our economies back on track, but also to ensure that we come back stronger and more resilient than ever before, not the least of which is having a secure and stable environment within our region and the broader international community. From the Philippines' perspective, perhaps the most acute and consequential geopolitical development in recent years has been the growing great power rivalry between the United States and China. One only has to look at the recent incidents such as the case of the high altitude surveillance balloon, they now call it the balloonies, as well as the positions and actions taken by the two countries with respect to Russia's aggression against Ukraine to have an understanding of how the relationship between the two countries significantly affects the rest of the international community. Indeed, while this competition between these two great powers is playing out in many parts of the world, nor is this more intensely felt in the Indo-Pacific region where a number of flashpoints can potentially lead to a confrontation that hardly anyone wants. While there are various security challenges in our part of the world that are of concern to the Philippines, let me just briefly note two issues that have been around for decades but which have undertaken new significance under the framework of the U.S.-China competition. The first issue directly includes or involves the Philippines, which is a claimant state in relation to the territorial and maritime disputes surrounding the South China Sea, while the second is a growing tension across the strait between China and Taiwan. As in-depth a discussion of both of these issues is beyond the scope of this lecture. Suffice to say that these are two of the most pressing external challenges for the Philippines, and it is critical that these are managed carefully while long term and lasting solutions still prove abusive and ensure that tensions that might lead to an escalation of conflict are minimized. Cognizant of these and other security challenges facing the country, the Philippines has sought to strengthen its engagement and cooperation with partners and neighbors at the bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels. In the interest of time, allow me to focus on the developments in the bilateral relations between the Philippines and the United States and how strong relations contribute towards enhancing our security. There is no doubt that both countries play a lot of importance in the cultivation of bilateral relationship, and this has been made manifest through the flurry of activities and engagements at all levels of government, business, and people-to-people -people exchanges in the recent years, but most especially within the last year under the administration of President Marcos. From President Biden being the first foreign leader to call and congratulate the president-elect Marcos, after election results came out last May, to their bilateral meeting in New York City in September during the UN General Assembly meetings, to the visit of Vice President Kamala Harris to the Philippines in November, these engagements at the highest levels not only fostered personal ties and built mutual trust and confidence among our leaders, they also provided numerous opportunities to review the state of our relationship and to chart its future course, as well as open new areas of cooperation while deepening and enhancing existing, uh, the existing areas. One of the most important foundations of our bilateral relationship is, of course, our decades-old security alliance, our mutual defense treaty, which is bolstered by the Visiting Forces Agreement and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation or Agreement, or EDCA. And as you may have heard, read in the news, particularly after the visit of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin 
last month when there was an agreement on four new EDCA sites in addition to the five existing ones. The additional locations would further boost our collective defense and capabilities, promote interoperability between our forces, and address existing and potential security threats to our nation and people, both traditional and non-traditional. With the Philippines being vulnerable to natural disasters, the additional sites will also allow the United States to respond more quickly to disasters that could hit other areas in our country in the future. While a critical element of a bilateral relationship is, secure, is the security alliance, the Philippines believes that our ability to fulfill our obligations under the MDT, or the Mutual Defense Treaty, is contingent on having a strong economy that can withstand pressure and intimidation from countries. Which is why, corollary to our security alliance, we also seek to boost our economic <coughs> engagement with the United States. The Philippines' economic priorities are well aligned with the priorities of the United States, enabling us to work closer together on several areas of cooperation, such as renewable and clean energy, including nuclear power, supply chain resilience, in particular semiconductors and nuclear minerals, food security, climate and sustainability, and digitalization. The Philippines was one of the first countries to join the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or the IPEF, recognizing that working with the United States and its allies in the region will build a more resilient and robust economy and redound to our mutual benefits. As an APEC member economy, the Philippines is in full support of the United States hosting of the APEC summit, as well as its meeting leading to the summit in San Francisco in November. With these considerations in mind, 2023 certainly promises to be a busy year for our two nations and for our relations, with the first two months of the year already seeing the holding of the 10th Bilateral Strategic Dialogue, as well as the visit of U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to Manila. Next month, we expect to host several cabinet secretaries, including our foreign defense and, of course, our economic managers, who will be here for the IMF World Bank spring meetings and other related meetings. While we certainly expect President Marcos to visit the West Coast later in the year to the APEC summit, we are also working on a possible standalone visit here in Washington, D.C., although we have yet to agree on the likely dates. In the midst of these geopolitical realities, especially in our part of the world, the Philippines and the United States are at the juncture where important relations call for a heightened and balanced security alliance and economic engagements. Without any doubt, having a strong bilateral relationship between our two countries will contribute to the regional peace, stability, and security in the Indo-Pacific area. I think I've said enough. Thank you. I'm ready for any questions. Thank you. First, well, first, um, thank you so much for such a wonderful remark. And before we um, open it up to the um, to the audience, I have three questions that I wanted to ask um, for Ambassador. So my first question is, how can the U.S. Philippines alliance can help counter? Uh, the Chinese military aggression as well as influence in the region of Southeast Asia? Well, clearly, the alliance that we have forged with the United States, we've had this alliance since 1951, the Mutual Defense Treaty, that is. And uh, it is really more of a deterrent that we are looking at. And I think that we have, uh, both our countries have agreed. And since the Philippines is obviously located in one of the most expensive real estates in, this, in the Pacific region, which is right in the center of Asia, we, you can see why it is very important for us to work with like-minded countries, not only like the United States, but Australia, Japan, and other countries that have the same uh, 
fears of any aggression coming from a country like China. This is more of a deterrent. While we continue to reach out with China, the problem really is we have avoided poking the polar bear or the panda bear, as they say. But, you know, um, I think there's always a limit to all of these things uh, that are happening in any part of the world. So, uh, like President Biden said, don't, ask, don't underestimate the United States. And uh, the American ego is high up there. And so, and we do have a Philippine ego too. So, there is that situation where we need to really make it clear and be very strong in our commitment in the Indo-Pacific region that we will not um, allow any kind of aggression or intimidation coming from China. Thank you. My second question is, how can the people-to-people -people strategy better promote and strengthen the us Philippines alliance? Well, people-to-people the -people obviously is, is, is an important part of, our, of the whole equation. Um, we obviously have a lot of uh, Filipino Americans here in the United States. Uh, they've done very well. We're very proud of them. Uh, they played a major role in the last pandemic, uh, many of our nurses and doctors. And uh, of course, you, you have also a number of American citizens who live in the Philippines and retired there, actually. So this type of exchange has been there for a long time. And now we have a number of students who actually uh, have got to school here and are going to school here. All these exchanges are part and parcel of why we have the same like-minded way of thinking in terms of the way we see our democracy and our freedom. Thank you. And my last question is, so the United States and the Philippines have a strong trade and investment relationship with over um, $18 billion in goods and services traded during 2020, as the U.S. is the Philippines' third largest trading partner. So in that regard, what are the key foreign policy objectives for um, the Marcos administration towards the U.S. as well as other allied countries in Asia? Well, as I said um, earlier, the, the thrust of President Marcos really is for us to have what we call economic security. This is very important for any country. Um, at the end of the day, economic security plays a major role in how a country remains stable and strong. And... Uh, the message is clear that we, while we look at the United States as our uh, most trusted ally, 85% of Filipinos think so, we also want to be a real partner. And by that, I mean we want to be economically strong. We, we don't, uh, as I've told our friends here in the U.S. Congress, I always tell them I'm not here to ask for aid, but we want more trade. So more trade, less aid is what we're looking at. Okay, now um, we're going to open up the Q&A session for our attendees, and if you have any questions, please raise your hand now. Gentlemen, back. Ms. Beer. My question is, would the Philippines join the PANO, Pacific Alliance, a treaty organization made with the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, Vietnam, and the U.S. to counter Chinese rise? The second question is, would you welcome another Navy base in the Philippines, U.S. Navy base? What is that, U.S.? Navy. Uh, Navy base. Well, uh, well, let me ask you. Uh, let yes, me answer your first question. Uh, we we are prepared to uh, join an alliance with many of our uh, friends and allies around the region, and of course, uh, uh, as you know, we already have uh, an informal agreement with Japan and Australia into uh, working uh, with our maritime security, and we are looking forward uh, to having like-minded countries band together to be a strong uh, alliance in just simply trying to give a message, as I said, and it's a deterrent that any kind of uh, aggression is unacceptable. Uh, now, as far as uh, bases are concerned, we have a new constitution in the Philippines which does not allow foreign bases uh, to, uh, to operate in the Philippines. And so uh, that is uh, enshrined in our constitution while, while we see the importance of our alliance with the United States, so we have come out with what we call the, the Enhanced Defense uh, Cooperation, which allows, uh, on a rotation basis, the Visiting Forces Agreement, which allows uh, American troops to 
come to the Philippines and train with our soldiers. And I think that that has worked very well for us because our soldiers are extremely uh, uh, getting more and more trained and be ready for any eventuality. But the bottom line is, I think that, that kind of cooperation is most welcome and many other countries are actually doing the same thing now, which is really a, uh, like a sort of like a, uh, an example of how cooperation and working together interoperability between our forces can be uh, achieved. Thanks, sir. Thanks so much. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good to see you again. Have yes. a seat. Have a yes. seat since the Philippines. So, um, Augustus Alzona, Asian, Filipino, Catholic, traditionalist, Catholic, American, mm -hmm. nationalist. Okay. Um, my question is this: Is um, is it true that um, the uh, I'm recording this too? that the uh, Biden administration, as well as the UN, and some very rich and powerful globalist forces are silently putting pressure on the Philippine government to uh, legalize, I guess, for lack of a better term, the extremist homosexual agenda, which includes gay marriage, as well as all the LGBT trans stuff. Well, uh, there is no such thing as that. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, we're sovereign countries. So <clears throat> we uh, we have always uh, made it clear to many of our friends and allies, and all other countries for that matter, is that we, um, our government has always uh, practiced uh, listening to advice, but we make our own decisions. And as far as that is concerned, I think that that's totally uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's unacceptable even to even talk about it on that basis. So we we we, we certainly we certainly um, have the same values as most countries as far as uh, freedom, and uh, and we, we we do not engage in such uh, activities even if we are a uh, a country that is all predominantly Catholic. We, but at the same time, we have freedom of religion in the Philippines and freedom of expression. And everything else that goes with it. Thank you. Gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your time today. Uh, I have two questions for you. Um, firstly, on the South China Sea, uh, the US, Japan, Australia have expressed support following recent incidents with China. What is the Philippines looking for those countries uh, in terms of support or activity on a bilateral and multilateral basis? Uh, and then secondly, following the recent announcements, there was some criticism in the Philippines, including from the president's uh, sister, the senator. Um, is this criticism, would it, do you expect it to be an impediment to EDCA implementation? Well, um, first and foremost, uh, answer to your first question. Obviously, uh, these countries that you mentioned have the same uh, feeling as we do, that we have to be uh, together when it comes to territorial integrity and sovereignty. And so we are working with them in, uh, again, as I said, uh, the maritime security and freedom of navigation. Now, as I just said just a few minutes ago, we have, we are practicing the democratic principles in the Philippines. We have a free an open society. Uh, the sister of the president is a senator of the Republic of the Philippines. She's free to express her opinion, of course. And because she uh, is uh, very much tuned to the, the northern part of the Philippines where this particular sites are going to be located, her fear is very, uh, I would say, it is uh, it's very real because of the Taiwan issue. And the north, the northern part of the Philippines, uh, where the Marxists are from. On a clear day, you can actually see Taiwan in the northern part of the Philippines. So it's a fear that they, uh, that they have in that part of our country. And uh, they feel that uh, this type of uh, having a, these sites open to visiting forces of the United States may ignite or 
drag us into it. But I think the way we see it is that it's, 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 it is a deterrent, and at the same time, it is part of our defense strategy. And I think President Marcos uh, will continue and uh, pursue that uh, that objective in making sure that our defense strategy remains in place. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Master. Uh, so I want to ask you, uh, so Philippines is right uh, to the south of China. Now, logistically, uh, if you look at the balloon that came, got manufactured in China, would have crossed North Korea, Japan, or the north. On the south, it would have gone through Philippines. So what I'm wondering is, sure, they would have manufactured the balloon, but how can we so sure it may not have come from North Korea? Or even for that matter, Russia, because manufacturing is one thing, transporting is one more thing. Do you think we are jumping to judgments or conclusions without bringing out some proper you know, analysis, hypothesis? Well, uh, as far as, I, I mean, just try to, the briefing that was actually given to our defense people on, on, on this uh, balloon issue is, uh, clearly they see that as a, uh, as, as uh, is what happened here in, uh, in in the United States very recently, and I understand it has happened in, in to other countries too. And China has admitted to it that uh, they were actually they were claiming or they denied that it was uh, to to do any kind of uh, spying on on the United States military uh, installations or whatever. It was just purely for weather or whatever it is, but. You know, we, we hear the same story all the time, just like the laser incident that happened in the Philippines, where uh, the military-grade laser was pointed at our our Coast Guard, and at the same time, even our fishermen, who constantly are being harassed almost every single day. And they have been fishing in those, in those areas for hundreds of years. So, and then you have the Chinese ambassador saying that this is, he showed us a pen that was uh, a laser, he said, this is what we used. I mean, that's practically telling you, you're so stupid. We're not. So certainly we won't allow that. And I think the United States is also feeling the same thing with the balloon issue. Uh, they were told that it was just purely, uh, 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 what do you call, for the weather or for whatever it is. So these are things I think that uh, sometimes uh, you try your best to, to avoid any kind of when some. A country consistently denies it and makes it seem that it was nothing really and makes you look like you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, it, it becomes to a point of being insulting, I think. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Ambassador, for having us today and such a um, wonderful remark. and. Uh, before we close the event, I want to share our upcoming event. So the China Asia program just launched a new event series, which is called Mentoring Series. Uh, mentoring? Yeah, Mentoring Series for Intelligence and Foreign Policy Careers. And uh, we'll be hosting Dr. Jen Goldman, uh, who's the editor uh, of, in, uh, of Chief in, uh, for the Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. So please, um, it'll be a virtual event, by the way. So if you'd like to check out any one of our events, please go to iwp.edu. And thank you all for coming today. Thank you.